Okay, and all right, and so where were we? Okay, so we had read something about uh, uh, the pure pure devotional service, and we were talking about uh, um, the pure devotional service. Basically, means that there are no uh, material desires. However, there could be some, what you would call a uh, extraneous desires. For example, you talked about, you know, if a pure devotee is in trouble, he says, Krishna, please save me. Uh, that's not a material desire as such. So even though that kind of desire, no problem. Uh, because the desire um, is with the intent of wanting to serve Krishna more. So while it's not directly a desire for Krishna's pleasure, it's a, it's a desire for self-reservation. But, but you know, uh, the devotees say, I want to serve you, so I don't want to you know, be in a position where I cannot serve you. And therefore, that's still pure devotional service. So that's where we were. And uh, I just wanted to add, if I didn't say it last week, that Uttam, you see, pure devotional service translated in this verse, by Srila Rupa Goswami as Bhakti Uttama, right? The last two words of the verse. So Uttam, the word Uttam is consisting of two words. The first word is Ut, U-T, Ut, and second word is Tama, T-A-M-A. So Tama means darkness or, or ignorance, and Ut means above. So Uttama means something that's above the darkness or above ignorance. That means transcendental, because everything material is darkness or ignorance. So something above that is transcendental, which means pure devotional service is transcendental. You could even say it's gunatit, which means it's uh, above the three modes of material nature. Rajoguna, Saptamoguna, Satoguna. Even above Satoguna. Okay? So... So basically, pure devotee is someone who's not only not covered by mode of ignorance or passion or even goodness, which happens because of karma, kant, jnana, kant, etc. But pure devotee is uh, has transcended all the most uh, most of material. As uh, Lord Krishna says, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14, 26 says. Uh, so he transcends all the gunas and transcends in the Brahmabhuta platform, which is transcendental platform, and he becomes a pure devotee. I think that's where we had stopped. Okay, so once again, I'm going to invite you to see if there's any questions. I'll start with the material for this week. I need to start reading from where we left off. So I hope you have a book uh, handy. And, it was page uh, XXIB. Correct. X. Correct. Uh, correct. And it starts with the and philosophical speculation. Oh, I have a question. Oh, okay, sure. Go ahead, please. Uh, when we talk about bhakti uh -huh. and we say that uh, it is uh, not a material activity, so mm -hmm. is, is bhakti. Uh, we know that we are in this this uh, question may sound really stupid but we know that we are in this material world but bhakti is not anyway uh, material in any nature because we are doing it for the lord so is it considered to be in the material world or is it considered to be uh, outside of this material world i am not saying the spiritual world but is it outside the material world well, so first of all, outside the material world is spiritual world. So there's nothing in between. Okay. Okay. So there's no third world. Okay. Okay. So are they spiritual or material? So that's one thing. Second thing is when you're performing pure devotional service, you have transcended all the modes of material nature. Therefore, you're on a spiritual platform, which is transcendental platform above the material platform. So even though, um, even though, um, you're performing the activity in the material world, 
the activity is not material. Um, let me see if I can remember there was another verse in, that will come later on um, the craft devotion. So the person who's serving the Lord by body, mind, and speech constantly, then no matter what condition or state or status he is in, he is Jivan Mukta, he is on a liberated platform, therefore performing um, transcendental activities only. So it looks like he's doing something material, but it's not. Not only that, pure devotees, their body may look like they're material, but they're not. They become spiritualized. Am I answering your question, Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. So somebody found that page, which starts with and philosophical speculation. The second one, first paragraph. It says, and philosophical speculation. There in the page. Okay, so it's uh, last time we were in page XXIII. This is XXIV. Okay, so go back to XXIII. Yes. Okay, does anybody see that paragraph? It's starting with karma. Well, so Sorry. just keep going. So starting with karma. I can do karma. Okay, good. But the, the, the paragraph starts with um, karma. And uh, so, karma or routine activities. Yeah, so basically, I think, the, I think the paragraph started with the definition of a pure devotee as given by the Prabhu Swami. Yeah. Right? Yes, so we had read, read the first two lines. Any okay. desire except for service of the Lord is called material desire. That's the point we had stopped. Are you there? Yes, Prabhu, I found it. Okay, so has everyone found it? No. Okay, so let's wait for a second. Have we found, Prabhuji, what's the page number? So this is Prabhu XXI5, like 15. Okay, so it's XXIV. Ivy, sorry, yeah. The paragraph, 40, okay. The paragraph and, starts with the definition of a pure yeah. devotee. Yeah. Yes. And this yeah. is in between the paragraph, mm -hmm. like one, two, sixth lines mm -hmm. from the top. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So is everybody with me now? Yes. 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 Anybody not with me? <laughs> okay. Okay, Prabhuji, then go ahead, please. Okay, I can go. And philosophical speculation refers to the sort of speculation which ultimately arrives at a conclusion of voidism or impersonalism. This conclusion is useless for a Krishna conscious person. Only rarely by philosophical speculation can one reach the conclusion of worshipping Vasudev Krishna. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita itself. The ultimate end of philosophical speculation then must be Krishna with the understanding that Krishna is the everything, the cause of all causes, and that one should therefore surrender unto him. If this ultimate goal is reached, then philosophical advancement is favorable. But if the conclusion of philosophical speculation is voidism or impersonalism, that is not bhakti. Right. Thank you, Prabhu. So, first of all, can anybody guess what verse in Bhagavad Gita is being referred to here? Just, just a wild guess. Oh, wonderful, Sudhashi Prabhu, you're the best. Yes, the 719. That's the verse being uh, mentioned here. So basically it's saying, it's very rare that a jnani would come to the platform of Vasudev. You know, it can happen or it does happen, but after many, many lifetimes. Many, many lifetimes. So, if somebody is able to get to that point, it's fine. But Rupa Goswami is saying that that's very rare. Some Mahatma Sudhulabha, very rare. You know, otherwise, philosophical speculation always, almost always, leads to voidism or impersonality. Shunyavadi. 
nirvishesha shunyavadi right so that's what it leads to so we don't want that that's not bhakti so what's what's actually being said here is the second line of the verse right so first line was anya abhilashta shunyam second line is gyan karmadi anavrutam so it's talking about gyan and karma so in this paragraph it's talking about if our bhakti is covered by philosophical speculation the gyana then it's not bhakti because it's not leading to krishna it's not leading to the to the understanding that krishna is the cause of everything krishna is all in all sava karan karanam therefore it's not bhakti okay all right so clearly this is also if you recall last week we talked about primary characteristic swarup lakshan a secondary characteristic tatrasa lakshan so gyan karma de anavartam would make it secondary characteristic of to devotion service that's covered by gyan okay uh excuse <coughs> gyan or karma i'm sorry um if if it gets covered by gyan and karma then it becomes ordinary devotion okay. service sorry can everyone please pause yourself i'm sorry mute yourself if you're not speaking if you have a question by all means unmute and ask the question okay thank you so we'll keep the extraneous voices and sounds away all right so if it's pure devotion service if covered by gyan or karma so gyan mishra karma mishra then it becomes ordinary devotion service it's no longer pure devotion service okay so ordinary devotion service can also be intended to please krishna so it's not that ordinary devotion service is not intended to please krishna i mean you know someone like me who is a sadhaka you know aspiring devotee that's what i am doing i still have gyan mishra and uh, karma mishra bhakti right but i'm trying to please krishna so it's not pure but still the intention is to please krishna on the other hand the pure devotional service is free from any ulterior motive and not covered by any gyan or karma philosophical or fruitive activities okay now i'm not saying that there should be no philosophical speculation some of it can be there but if the philosophical interest becomes more prominent than our or bhakti then that will cover our devotional attitude and make it from pure to general devotion service okay so i'm going to pause and see if that's clear or not prabhu ji i have a question ha boliye you you said there can be some philosophical speculation what do you mean by that like well, so for example we don't know krishna okay we don't understand the philosophy very well yeah so sometimes we speculate well krishna must look like that you know uh, how does krishna do that and try to imagine krishna doing this or that or that mm-hmm. right that's philosophical speculation but at least focused on krishna already accepting krishna is uh, is a person okay right so so don't confuse gyan from gyan <laughs> so uh, gyan when it's taking you away from uh, the scriptures what the scriptures describe right you try to do it on your own that gyan is bad okay okay, okay. But, but at least you have some background knowledge and then you based on that you can imagine speculate basically but it, but it's still based on scriptures yeah. okay see because because we're not pure devotees we do not fully understand krishna right so do some speculation uh-huh. and that is fine mm-hmm. but as long as speculation not this kind of oh maybe it's not a person maybe it's just energy you know mm-hmm. maybe energy looks like that then that's bad as long as you're not going towards voidism and impersonalism yes you got it safe zone you got it okay thank you sure anybody else okay so yes, that no, one one question ah, please go ahead yes so prabhu gyan mixit and karma mixit bhakti can we is it at transcendental level or this is mixed with material thing yeah it's mixed it's mixed it's mixed yeah. so we cannot say it's purely transcendental or not all, also purely material it's somewhere mixed it's somewhere mixed yes okay 
Yes, okay. Is that if the percentage is pure, it's transcendental. Okay, so we, we I don't mean to insult anybody, but most of us are doing karma misha bhakti. With some fruitive desires, some feeling that Krishna will give me this, or Krishna will give me that, or whatever, it's there. So therefore, it's not pure yet. Now, yes, we try to please Krishna, but there's also some feeling of, you know, I want to be pleased too. Right? Again, I'm talking about me, maybe none of you is on that level. I am still thinking about some material interests. Okay. Ashok Krishna, did I answer your question? Yes, 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 Prabhu. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So continue, please, somebody. Karma, fruitive activities. Can I? Please do. Yes, absolutely. If anyone else wants to go, they can. No, no, okay. go ahead. Okay. Karma or fruitive activities are sometimes understood to be ritualistic activities. There are many persons who are very much attracted by the ritualistic activities described in the Vedas. But if one becomes attracted simply to ritualistic activities without understanding Krishna, his activities are unfavor un unfavorable to Krishna consciousness. Actually, Krishna consciousness can be based simply on hearing, chanting, remembering, etc. Described in the Srimad Bhagavatam are nine different processes, besides which everything done is unfavorable to Krishna consciousness. Thus, one should always be guarding against fall downs. Right. So there are a lot of rituals um, involved in, uh, in practice of religion. It's, it's very interesting that to some people, rituals become more important than the actual act of devotional service. Hare Krishna Mataji, can you please mute yourself? Everyone, please. Ashok Krishna Prabhu, can you please take the responsibility to just keep everyone muted? And yes, 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 for a while. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Okay, so, so basically, we are discouraged from ritualistic activities, which are the karma, right? So uh, don't worry so much about all the rituals. If, you know, for example, uh, somebody says, well, um, you have to wave the fan seven times, you know, or something like, no, no, you got to take a shower and you got to take this mantra and then put this kind of clothes on and do that, all, all that. Um, that puts some rituals in that. If the rituals become more important, then actually the fights happen as well. My rituals are more important than your rituals or my rituals are more effective than your rituals and the fight happens. Somebody says, just read the book. Somebody says, no, just kneel down and pray. Somebody says, no, do arati. If you start focusing on all that, problems. And, and that's the problem in the modern society. I'm going away from the topic a little bit that uh, different religions, you know, Hindu, Muslim, uh, Christian, etc., etc. To most people, rituals are religion, but rituals are not religion. You know, as a matter of fact, pure uh, devotional service is free of rituals. This karma, gyan karmadi anavratam, free of karmas, free of rituals. You know, especially if uh, we don't understand what activities are favorable, what activities are not unfavorable to Krishna consciousness, then you can make real, uh, real uh, problems. And this paragraph saying, Krishna consciousness is just the nine processes of devotional service. Just stick with that. I starting with hearing and remembering, or hearing and chanting and remembering. And um, just stick to that. Uh, anything else outside of these nine processes is what you'd call extraneous and actually can become an impediment to pure devotional service. So therefore, Pure devotee must uh, remain on guard, not to let these extraneous activities overwhelm uh, or cover their nine processes of devotional service. Okay, uh, next paragraph. Yeah. 
Anybody? Let it go. I can read it, Prabhuji. Please go ahead. It's a very small paragraph. Uh, Shri Rupa Swami has also men mentioned in the definition of the bhakti, the word gyan, karmadi. The karmadi fruitive activity consists of activities which are unable to help one attain to pure devotional service. Many forms of so-called renunciation are also not favorable to Krishna conscious devotional service. Right. So basically, there's two things here. One is that we have to be very uh, careful about asking ourselves before we do anything, is this activity uh, going to be able to give me pure devotional service? So for example, uh, you know, in India, at least a lot of people who say, I'm going to take sannyas. You know, they wear saffron colored clothes or whatever, and then they walk away from their home. But are they really walking away from home to do pure devotional service? Or is it they're running away from their responsibilities? Um, do they really have any sense control? Or are they, you know, using this to get sense control? There's a lot of examples we know. People become Babaji and do all sorts of nonsense. So Rupa was saying, none of that is leading us to devotional service and therefore it's not good, including, you know, certain types of renunciation. But he doesn't stop at jnana karma. The next word after karma is adi. Jnana karma adi. Anavratam. So what does Lord Adi mean? Anybody knows? Nobody knows what Adi means? Etc. Right? Etc. Yes, exactly. And etc. is a very interesting word. So sometimes it's used because we try to explain something and we forget the details. So say, oh, etc. etc. Like for example, somebody said, oh, can you name the five Pandavas? And he says, Bhim, Arjun, etc, etc, etc. We couldn't remember the other three names. You know, of course, somebody else was even better than him. And somebody says, can you name the five Pandavas? And this Punjabi speaking guy, he says, Pima, Arjuna, or A, or Vo, Panja, So that's what etc means. If you don't remember the examples, um, the specifics, I mean, you say etc. Here, on the other hand, it's being used to say, if I start naming everything, it'll become too long. So I'm saying the two main things are jnana and karma, but there are other pursuits also. So for example, people do havan. People do some kind of a puja, you know, a tree or whatever. They're mainly done more from a perspective of um, social activity, you know, religious activities, but and they're fine, but if they become more prominent than uh, direct bhakti that we're trying to do, then that's not good. If they overshadow our devotional activities, then it's not good. So our emphasis always has to be on the nine processes of chanting, I mean, of devotional service, chanting, hearing, remembering, etc. Because otherwise, our devotional attitude will be covered by this extraneous activities like the Havan and all that, and it will disqualify us from pure devotional service. So we have many examples of many famous people in different ages performing huge uh, fire sacrifices, but they were not all pure devotees. So for example, uh, King Prithu was a devotee and he did big, big uh, yagyas, but Daksha wasn't and he did many uh, Havans. And fire sacrifices. So it's important that we understand the difference and we're important that we don't allow any processes other than the nine that we talk about to overtake or overwhelm or overshadow any of these nine activities. Now, some, some ritualistic activities are done out of what you would call social convention. So, so activities um, that are performed simply because there is social convention or tradition uh, can be done as long as they don't 
um, cover our devotion service. So for example, a very famous example is Lord Chaitanya. He went to Gaya. Why did he go to Gaya? To offer Pinda upon his father's death. Um, but because this social convention, nothing to do with his devotion service, that was okay. Uh, another example I can give you is astrology. Now, astrology does have, I should say, it does serve a purpose. Astrology is proper science, but I'm never too sure about astrologers. So if somebody um, puts some faith in astrology, no problem. But if somebody puts more faith in the power of destiny, than the power of bhakti, then his devotional service is covered or it will be actually impeded and it will be difficult for him to surrender to Krishna. Do you understand that point? If somebody says, I'm going to depend upon astrology, do everything based on astrology, and just do accordingly. Well, then where's the power of Krishna? Where's the power of bhakti? If everything's based on destiny, well, there you go. That's Karma Mimansa uh, philosophy. Doesn't work. Okay, But you can still have some of that. So for example, somebody told me that uh, Srila Popat did not like to go anywhere between uh, 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Thursdays. Unless there was some Kirtan or lecture opportunity to do or, or you know, spreading Krishna consciousness opportunity. Then he didn't care. So in other words, he believed in some of this, but not to the degree that will impede his devotional service. Okay? Same thing can be applied to any other pursuit, like renunciation we talked about, uh, all kinds of yogas that we hear about. I mean, they are fine, but as long as they don't cover our bhakti. And that's the main thing. If it's side activity, it's not necessary, but okay, no problem. But if overtaking our bhakti is a big problem. So my point basically I'm trying to make, maybe in very long, too many words, is our motive in life is to awaken our eternal loving relationship with Krishna, our bhakti. Other pursuits may be undertaken, but as long as they're secondary, it's okay. The moment they become primary, not okay. So let me pause again and see if that point is clear. Or if there are any questions. Oji, I have a question, Prabhuji. Holy uh, What I have heard or what we have seen, sometimes the bhakti changes the destiny. Like if we say, like in astrology, it, it is said like, okay, this is in your uh, destiny. Like, but uh, sometimes it is changed by the bhakti. So it says, uh, like in the last, uh, we were reading the last uh, shloka of Shri Mad Bhagavatam, Nam Sakirtan Yashya Sarapapa Paranashiti. So then we will consider, like, uh, uh, if we got to, supposed to face some bad destiny and we do bhakti, that thing it has, can be changed with the bhakti. Is that right, Prabhuji, or not? Yes, Prabhuji, that's totally right. That's totally right. There are many, many verses in that regard, how devotion service can change your destiny. And main reason being, uh, in Brahma Sanghita, um, that Brahma says, Karmani nidhati kintacha bhakti bhajam. The devotion service burns your karmas completely, right from the root. And therefore, when the karmas are burned, your destiny has automatically changed. So sometimes we say Krishna changed the destiny, she, destiny, uh, destiny, or sometimes we say bhakti change. But yes, you are right. Bhakti can change your destiny. Thank you, Prabhuji. Sure. Anybody else? And I have heard, Prabhuji, that bhakti gives increase in your lifespan also. It's possible. It's possible. When the karmas are gone, then anything is possible. It says few, by few minutes every day your age increases. Oh, because I haven't heard that as a plan. I, maybe it's true, I don't know, but I have not heard that. Where did you hear that? Oh. 
I don't know. It was in from some Bhagavatam class. Okay, no, so it may be true. I just don't know. No, I just mentioned that's it. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Um, oh, bro, ah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. No, no, you can go. It's okay. <laughs> Chaitanya okay. is very okay. polite. Okay. Um. Uh. So. like the related question prabhu ji actually ha boliye yeah. um is bhakti also uh destined ah thank you for asking very good question thank you thank you thank you um we were saying a few minutes ago um bhakti is on a transcendental platform destiny is on a material platform so they don't meet it's like in toronto young street and avenue road or dufferin street they are parallel they never meet so therefore bhakti has nothing to do with destiny destiny has nothing to do with bhakti the only thing bhakti has to do with destiny is that can change it but that's about it so second point is bhakti comes from free will destiny comes from karmas you understand that point so you can you say it again please ha huh, sure bhakti comes from our free will destiny comes from our karmas okay thank you sure so when we use our free will then we can decide to serve krishna that's one point second point is if you go back to the origin and there is another another verse we'll talk about later on in this discussion of bhakti uh, uh, net of devotion it says aado shraddha tato sadhu sang ath bhajan kriya right sat nishtha and all those things nine stages are for developing pure devotional service so when we have served a devotee somewhere somehow knowingly or unknowingly we develop a small amount of faith having developed that small amount of faith if we choose our free will to say i want to serve krishna then krishna will make arrangements to associate to give you association with a pure devotee and then you start into bhajan kriya etc and then takes on from there so the two are very different sorry two different platforms okay the only thing is bhakti can change your destiny but you cannot be destined to become bhakta if that's what you trying to say okay does that make sense if it doesn't make sense ask me follow on question nandu prabhu nandu kumar prabhu yes prabhu ji thank you i was so, sorry i was on mute and i was talking okay so this is so thank you prabhu ji like yeah like this is always confusing and uh, like i mean this this confusion is always there right like so no longer right yeah, I, <laughs> yeah yeah yes i mean like this is very important like these two points are like yeah. very important to understand yeah. yes yeah. okay thank you for asking prabhu thank you very good okay chaitanya you were trying to ask question uh, yes prabhu ji uh, so uh, like you said that bhakti burns karmas right mm-hmm. so does it mean that um, so does it mean that destiny doesn't work on devotees because i have heard some acharya saying that uh, devotees are from far from destiny and these things okay that's another excellent question and i want to be careful how i answer it so by becoming devotee prabhu can you please sorry prabhu can you please repeat the question yeah so the question was thank you padmakshi uh, patel the question was are the are the devotees lives uh determined by their destiny or does this change it completely right chaitanya does say it right yes yes prabhu ji okay so first of all let's not confuse devotee with pure devotee okay so because pure devotee's life is determined completely by lord krishna महात्मनस्तु मां पार्थ दैवीं प्रकृति माशिता ही बिकॉज़ टोटली डिपेंडेंट अपॉन द इंटरनल पोटेंसी योग माया ऑफ लॉर्ड कृष्णा 
and all his activities, all his destiny, etc., etc., is governed by Lord Krishna. Karma has nothing to do with it. So his destiny is totally different from destiny we talk about. So that's one thing. Those of us who are in the middle somewhere, right? We are still governed by destiny. However, our bhakti can interrupt, interfere, and change our destiny depending upon up the purity of our, our devotion. So if by destiny we're talking about material things, it's all karma, even if we are a devotee, except we are not pure devotee. And, and if you're a pure devotee, there's no material karma involved anymore because it's all been burnt. It's everything happening by Krishna's desire, the life of devotee, including all the miseries a pure devotee may get. Now we have so many examples, but the Kunti, the Pandavas, uh, Prahlad Maharaj, they all went through so much misery. But that was all Krishna's plan to either purify them further or to test them or to set an example for people like us as to this is how one should deal with the miseries and many other reasons, time factors and all those kinds of things. My point is that a pure devotee's life and destiny is being determined by Krishna directly. Non-pure devotees are a mixture uh, and non-devotees are totally by karmas. Makes sense. Thank you, Prabhuji. Okay. So everyone clear on that because that's an excellent question. Chaitanya, thank you. Yeah, Prabhuji, huh. I have. So you put men very nicely. Bhakti can interrupt, uh, interrupt uh, the karma, uh, interrupt the uh, what you call kar karma, the karma. Yeah, destiny. destiny can ah. interrupt destiny. Ah. So, what we understand from here, pa partly Krishna can you know can burn and uh, he may not burn. So we may suffer because of past karma. That's what we always say that you know if any suffering is there, it's because of my past karma. But anything uh, uh, other good happens, it's uh, by mercy of the Lord Krishna. This is how we interpret. Pro, so it's a little more complicated than that. Okay. So the verse I think you are referring to is a devotee's interpretation of what's happening. So tatte anukapam susamikshamano bhunjana bhunjana evadu katham vipaka het gyan bhakti vidhan namaste jivet yos sada mukti padesa dai bhag. That's the one from I think it's 10, 14, 8 or something like that. Uh, so basically, a devotee when he's in trouble. He says, all because of my karma. And he doesn't stop serving the Lord. And therefore, he becomes uh, an eligible heir to Golok Vrindavanda. So that's a devotee's attitude. But Krishna may have different reason for putting a devotee in trouble. It's either to make him appreciate uh, uh, the power of Krishna and the power of devotional service, or time factor, or he wants to make an example of it to show yeah. us how to deal with the miseries, how the attitude should be, what the attitude should be, so on and so forth. Or it could be because he wants, Krishna wants devotee to appreciate the power of bhakti even more. So the example is given that uh, just like we're able to appreciate the dawn of the day after dark night, mm. very much so, just like we're able to appreciate uh, a lamp in when it's very dark, as opposed to when it's sunlight, uh, just like uh, a cold shower feels really good in the summertime and a hot shower feels really good in the wintertime. Similarly, uh, putting a devotee in trouble makes the devotee appreciate Krishna even more when he comes out of it or he remembers while in the trouble. So because, yes. again, Krishna makes the point, if everything was good, it is possible that devo devotee becomes complacent mm -hmm. and the appreciation goes away. <laughs> Is by reminding you, by putting in trouble, they say, don't forget, don't forget. Right? So there are different reasons. I don't want to say there's one reason. There's at least eight or nine different reasons. That Today's not the time to get into the details. Yeah. But eight or nine different reasons why Krishna can put a pure devotee in trouble. Yeah, so Prabhu, that, that you made it a distinction very clearly pure. But for us, like uh, we, are, we are karma, we label a little bit of bhakti. But you mentioned that inter interrupts you know, yeah, the bhakti can interrupt. That means something is minimized. Correct. Right? Correct. Uh, so I'm just coming to that. Basically, okay. yeah. 
So he minimizes some of the impacts that we have, and uh, but everything is not gone. Yeah, as so as actually, the yeah. My mother used to say, for a for a devotee, when there was going to be a, I said it Hindi, I translated English. Bhala chupne wala tha, sui chupke reh gayi, which means somebody was going to get hurt by a spear, and he's got a poke with a needle. So yes, a lot of times it happens. It could have been a much bigger problem, but you get a small glimpse of a problem. So at least you know that you know what's causing it. Like yeah. sorry, what's causing the saving of the of the trouble? Yeah, thank you, Prabhuji. Okay, Prabhuji, I have another question. Haji, uh, Can the destiny stop somebody from the devotional service? No, this is what I was saying in the beginning. Devotional service is free will. Transcendental platform, mm -hmm. destiny, karma, they all material platform. Because so many people say, okay, when my when my destiny, you know, when allow me to go to the temple, I will go to the temple. Tell, tell them, tell them, Prabhu, anybody says to that, tell them you are a coward, you try to hide behind this because it has nothing to do with the destiny, with nothing to do with your karma. Whenever you want, you can start yeah. devotional service. Okay, thank you, you Prabhu. want. Yeah. Because they don't want to go to temple. They, they right. Don't. Right. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Ah. Prabhuji, uh, regarding this question, uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, in the in the where the Jad Bharat uh, pastime is mentioned, mm -hmm. Shukdev Goswami says that Jad Bharat, the deer came in the life of Jad Bharat because of his past karma. And because of that, he was not able to get liberated in that very life. So right. is that understood that somehow the destiny uh, tries to stop you from devotional service? Um, not really. There's, I think there's a different principle involved there. And the principle was yam yam bhavis smarna bhavat tritan takalevaram tamtam evis tante sadat bhav bhavita. So that's one principle. Whatever you're thinking about um, at the moment of death, that's the body you will get. Even as a deer, his bhakti didn't stop. Even as a deer, he remembered what he, mistake he made in the past life. So when he got the one, after that, he became Jal Bharata, he remained a pure devotee. With so much faith that even when the dacoits were about to, about to uh, sever his head, he had his eyes closed thinking about Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Sure, you're welcome. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. So, I had one question related to very excellent answer you gave regarding devotee and pure devotee. So if you can clarify uh, for me, uh, so there, is nit, there are nit baddha and nit siddhas, right? Mm -hmm. So devotees and pure devotee are like these two uh, completely two different class from which people can't go from here to there. For example, if there's a pure devotee, there will be never, uh, there will never be a fall down. Or if someone is a nit siddha, can, is it even possible to become like pure devotee? So, oh, no, you mean, you mean, okay, I want to make sure you're saying the question correctly. I think you meant Nitya Baddha, can he become pure devotee? Yeah, yeah. So basically, if yes. someone is Nitya Siddha, is there, any, is there ever a fall down? And for someone who is <clears throat> just a devotee, is it possible to become a pure devotee? Does that, like, is, are there two different, completely di different watertight compartment classes or how is it? Okay, so a Nitya Siddha can never fall down by definition. Okay, so that's the easy answer. Nitya Baddha, if they didn't have an opportunity to become a, a pure devotee, then they'll always be in the material world. That doesn't work. So Nitya Baddhas have the opportunity to become pure devotees. They're known as Sadhan Siddha, or they're known as... Uh, uh, Kapasiddha, um, and there's one other word I'm, term I'm trying to forget. So yes, uh, Nitya Baddhas can become pure devotees. And that's what, we, I mean, imagine, that's who we are. We are Nitya Baddhas, eternally conditioned. We're trying to become a devotee, and then hopefully one day pure devotee. If there are say, doors closed, then what are we doing here? Why are we in this class? Why are we reading Bhagavatam? Why are we reading Bhagavad Gita? Why are we going to the temple? Why are we chanting? So we're trying to become sadhana siddh or, or uh, kripa siddh or whatever, somehow or the other, become siddh, become pure devotee, so we can go back, back to Godhead. And then 
once we are go go there jaj katwan and nivartan play then we are not forced to come back is that what you were asking prabhu did i answer yeah, yeah. yes prabhu okay all right anyone else oh i have a question ha bolo you mentioned that uh, krishna puts the pure devotee in some kind of uh, misery or a difficult situation is to further purify them so uh, if if a devotee is a pure devotee is there uh, any further room to get more purified like what does that mean when you said so we said mother radha rani is like infinite beauty krishna infinite beauty like there is no nothing better than that but we also say that uh, when radha rani looks at krishna her beauty grows and when krishna looks at radha rani's beauty grow his own beauty grows when radha rani sees krishna's beauty grow her beauty grows more but they already infinite to start with so same thing is that on an absolute platform you talk about these things but not in the sense of material things that how can infinity increase so it's just it's just that pure devotees there's no contamination but it's like it's very difficult to understand it from a material point of view okay thank you bro okay sure okay so if no more questions then i just want to say let's review this definition one more time pure devotional service bhakti uttama is any activity intended that's the keyword intended to please krishna anukuliyane krishna anushilana okay but gyan karma di anavrata without any covering of philosophical or fruitive uh, activities or pursuits and any abhilashta shunyam no ulterior motive so once again pure devotional service is activity intended to please krishna without any ulterior motive and not covered by philosophical or fruity pursuits this is perfect definition each word in this verse is so precise that there's no room for us to misunderstand what pure devotion service means now it applies just as much whether we are sadhakas which means devotees in practice like us or those who are already pure devotees definition doesn't change okay so is everyone 100% clear on the definition of this verse that rupa goswam is giving for pure devotional service yes prabhu ji okay so i want to make a request i want everyone on this call to memorize this verse and and repeat it to yourself every day meditating upon what it really means so that's my request humble request up to you whether you take it or not which which one is that prabhu ji That's the verse that we've been covering, Prabhu. Anya blasta shunyam gyan karmadi anavrata. Yes. Okay. And that's the verse we've been discussing for two days. Okay. Is yes, everybody Prabhu. aware of what Prabhu. we're discussing? One thing, Prabhu ji. Can anyone read that again so that we know how to read? Okay. <laughs> so actually, if somebody can uh, share their screen, yeah, put it on the on the screen. The correct pronunciation of the letters. Sure. Puri, yeah, हाँ तो कोई words नहीं है. नहीं माता जी नहीं है. वो तो मेरा handout में भेजा आपको ना. अच्छा उसमें है. हाँ handout में भेजा हमने. Can somebody please yeah. record your handout? Yeah. Anya Vilasita Sonia. No, no. So can you share the screen? I just put it on the screen. I don't know how to do that. Okay, Ashok Krishna, who do you have the handout handy? Yes, Prabhu. Let me share. Yeah, please. Thank you.
Yeah, there you go. So you can just increase the font size. Okay, can everyone see this? Can everyone see it, please? Yes, yes, we will. Okay. Yes, sir. So the pronunciation is Anne Abhilashita Shunyam. Anne Abhilashita Shunyam. Gyan Karmadi Anavratam. Okay. Anukulyan Krishnanu Shilanam. Bhakti Uttama. Shilanam. Okay. Shilanam, yes. Okay. Thank you, Prabhuji. Now I will try to memorize it. Yeah, please. Everyone, and it's a new handout. So please, everyone, yeah. try to memorize it and meditate upon this. You know, uh, every day. What is trying to tell me? Okay, so did everyone find it in your handout? And Sudhashu Prabhu, I'll send it to you later. Sorry, Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, all right. So we're going to stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Okay. So then, then Sila uh, Rupa Goswami, in the next paragraph, he's uh, giving a translation of certain uh, verses to support his definition of pure devotional service. And he's starting with a very, very, another very, very famous verse, very prominent verse from Narada Pancharatra, which describes the pure devotional service of unalloyed bhakti. And uh, if, you, if you go to your handout again, the next verse that's there is that verse. So let me know when everybody has got it. It starts with Sarva Padhi Vinir Muktam. Actually, uh, uh, Ashoka Shambhu, can I ask you to put the, share the screen again? Let's put it on the screen. Yeah, I share it, Prabhu. This one, Sarvapadi in Nirmuktam. Yes. So everybody look for this in your handout. And it starts with Sarvopadi Vinirmuktam Tat Paratven Nirmalam. Rishi Ken Rishi Kesh Sevanam Bhakti Uchate. Prabhu, doesn't the shloka come in Bhagavatam as well? No. It may have been in the purport, but it's not in Bhagavatam. Oh. It is and not Prabhu, you're recording I... this, right? You're recording the session, right, Prabhu? Yes, I am. Isn't that red button supposed to blink? Pardon me for my technology knowledge is zero. I know it's, it's blinking on mine. It says recording and it's blinking. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. And once again, I request everybody please keep yourself on mute unless you're talking to me. So Sarvapadi Vinir Muktam, Tat Paratve Nirmalam. Rishiken Rishikesh Sevanam Bhakti Uchit. So we'll talk about that. Uh, but I wanted to make sure everybody's looking at the handout for this verse. Okay. Because the next paragraph in the book is basically translating this verse. So if you can please stop sharing and then you can go back to reading the book. So if somebody can volunteer to read the next paragraph. Shall I read probably? Please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Shall I Rupa Goswami? has also quoted a definition from Nard Panchatra as follows. One should be free from all material designations and by Krishna consciousness must be cleansed of all material contamination. He should be restored to his pure identity in which he engages his senses in the service of the proprietor of the senses. So when our senses are engaged for the actual proprietor of the senses, that is called devotional service. In our conditional state, our senses are engaged in serving these bodily demands. When the same senses are engaged in executing the order of Krishna, our acti activities are called bhakti. Yeah. Somebody can read the next paragraph as well. And they go together. 
Sir, I can read. As long as one identifies himself as belonging to a certain family, a certain society, or a certain person, he is said to be covered with designations. When one is fully aware that he does not belong to any family, society, or country, but is eternally related to Krishna, he then realizes that his energy should be employed not in the interest of so-called family, society, or country, but in the interest of Krishna. This is purity of purpose and the platform of pure devotional service in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is beautiful. Uh, so let me try and explain this. So I'm going to again take you back to the verse. It starts with Sarvopadhi. Upadhi is the designation. Sarvopadhi means all sorts of designation. I'm talking about the material designations. So free from all types of material designations. It also means free from all desires. Sorry, free from all material desires, which means uh, desires except the desire to serve Krishna. So free of all material desires. Again, it's very similar to the verse we just finished doing, Anyabhlashta Shunyam. The same thing. Anyabhlashta Shunyam saying the same thing. Sarvopadhi viril mukta. Free from all material desires. But also free from all material designations. And I'll come back to that in a second. So basically, um, um, this verse is saying that devotional service is simply engaging all our senses. Rishi Ken, Rishi K seven. Rishi Ken is the senses. Engaging all our senses in the service of Rishikesh, which is the Lord, not Krishna. So engaging all our senses in the service of Krishna is devotional service. Now, it also goes on to explain when we, when we, uh, when we, when we render devotional service, then two things happen. One is that we become free from all material designations, including material desires. And second is that our senses become purified simply from being engaged in the service of Krishna. So who wants to give me some examples of material designations? Give me some example. Of material being, a, being a CEO. Okay. What else? Indian, American, Canadian. Yes. Yes, anything else? Mother, father, brother, very, sister. Yes, very good. So actually, there's a very famous verse uh, that's in Chaitanya um, spoken by Lord, uh, Lord Chaitanya. He said, Naham vipro nacha narapati napi vashyo na shudra. Naham varni nacha grahapati navanistho yatirva. Kintu prodhyan nikhil paramananda punamrata abdhir. Gopi bhartur padakamaliyor das das das. He's saying, I'm not a Brahmin. I'm not a uh, uh, Grahasta. Sorry, uh, sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm not Chatriya. I'm not a Vaishya and I'm not Shudra. I'm also not a Sanyasi. I am not a Grahasta. I'm not, uh, what's called it? What's one Prastha. One Prastha, thank you. One Prastha. Or nor am I a Brahmachari. So basically, he's taking the whole one thing away. He said, I don't belong to Varnashram. Remember, pure devotees transcend the Varnashram system. But then who are you, Mahaprabhu? Who are you? You're not a Brahman, you're not Chatri, you're not a Vashya, not a Shuddha, you're not Sanyasi, you're not Ghasta, you're not Vantras, you're not Brahmachari. Who are you? He says, I am Gopi Bhartur Padakamaliyur Das Das Das. Gopi Bhartur means Krishna, the husband of the Gopis. And my Krishna's lotus feet servant of the servant of the servant of the servant servant so basically our real designation is not brahman chatri vashya shudra or sanyasi etc it's not male female it's not doctor uh, engineer ceo whatever my our designation is what anybody what is our real uh, designation that's that's another that's another it's servant of the servant of the servant 
Okay, that's how. So when we are rid of all the material designations, then we can appreciate being the dasanu das. That's our real designation. Now, what does das mean? Das means slave. That's the real meaning about das, not a servant. A slave. A slave has no freedom, no leeway, no flexibility. He does exactly what the master says. And that is what makes all the difference. When Arjuna said, Karishye Vachanam Tava in 1873, not year 1873, chapter 18, text 73 in Bhagavad Gita. He, he said, I'll follow all your instructions. No, no exceptions. All your instructions. That is Das. Whatever it is you say, my dear Lord Krishna, I will do. I will not say, oh, can I add this? Can I do that? Can I add my interpretation? Can I do it this way or that way? No. Follow the instructions as is. That's why Bhagavad Gita as is. And that's what makes the difference. If it's not as is, it's not bhakti. That's where you get Gyan Mishra, Karma Mishra, Gyan Kana, Jana Vrita, Adi, Adi, all those. So pure devotion service means do exactly what Krishna says. It is through the scriptures, through the spiritual master or whatever, but do exactly what says. And when that happens, then the same activity is bhakti or not bhakti. So for example, you have the battle of Purukshetra going on. Duryodhan is on one side, Arjuna is on one side. Arjuna is shooting his arrows, killing soldiers. Duryodhan is also shooting arrows, killing soldiers. But there's a big difference. What Arjuna is doing is pure devotion service. What Duryodhan is doing is Adharma, irreligion. But why? They're both doing the same thing. What's the difference? The difference is Arjuna is doing what Krishna told him to do. Arjuna is following Krishna's instruction there to the, to the nth degree, to the fullest. And therefore, what Arjuna is doing is pure devotional service. And what Duryodhana is doing is irreligion. Is that one clear? Because that's another very, very important point. Very clear, Prabhuji. Good, good. So, so bhakti is engaging our senses in the service of Krishna with the permission of Krishna. In uh, dovetailed with the desires of Krishna, that is Anukulian. Okay, so very important, very important. It has to be what Krishna wants. It has to be with Krishna's permission. It has to be the intended to please Krishna. Okay, I'll just stay with this verse. The verse talks about engaging senses in the service of Krishna. It doesn't talk about controlling senses. So engaging senses is different from controlling senses. We cannot control our senses. Artificial control doesn't work. That's why all these jnanis, yogis, they fall down. But we can redirect our senses by engaging them in the service of Krishna from material to devotional things. Krishna is the master of our senses. He is known as Rishikesh. So when we serve him, being the controller of our senses, he controls them and therefore he makes it easy for us to engage them in the service of Krishna as long as the, our intention is to please him. And this is why those people who are uh, able to engage their senses in the service of Krishna purely, they become Goswamis, controllers of their senses. It's not them controlling it, it's Krishna controlling it, but it looks like they're controlling it. Therefore, Goswami is actually a state of Krishna consciousness, nothing else. It's just a state of Krishna consciousness. Um, the best example of engaging our senses in Srimad Bhagavatam is somebody answer it. Ambarish. Ambarish, yes, thank you. Ambarish. So the whole set of famous verses, three, three of them actually. Savaya Munakrishna Padar Vindi or Vachansi Bhakunti Gunanamana. Karo Harer Mandir Majinadish. Shutim Chakar Achyuta Satkathodaya. Right? It goes on. It says he engaged his mind on what? Somebody keep answering it. What did Mahajambrish engage his mind on? Remembering Krishna. 
Yes, meditating upon lotus feet of Krishna. What it engages words. Speaking about Krishna. Yes, describing the glories of Krishna. Glory. What did he use his hands for? For making prasad. Okay, what else? Cleaning, cleaning temple. the cleaning yes. the temple. Yes. Cleaning the temple. What did he use his ears for? Krishna Katha. Krishna Katha, yes, absolutely. Um, so either words spoken by Krishna or about Krishna, right? What about his eyes? What were they engaged in? Krishna. Yes. So deities, temples, uh, holy places like Mathura, Vandavan, etc. He uses sense of touch for what? Yeah, touch the flowers of Krishna's hand. Massaging the feet of the devotees. Okay. What else? Lotus feet of the Lord. Massaging. Massaging, touching the... And also the devotees, by the way. Okay. What about his nose? Smelling the, the tulsi. Flowers. Flowers. Okay. flowers offered to, uh, to, to the Lord. What did he use his uh, tongue? Tasting Shadam. Rest Hare Krishna Mantra. There you go. And the glories, yes. And what about the legs? Walking and walking to the temple. Yatras and temple and yatras, yes. Holy places, what about his head? Going down to Coming the. Down yes. And above all, what about all his desires? What did he engage his desires in? In the, in the service of the Lord. Sorry, say again? In the service of the Lord. Yes, in the service of the Lord. Exactly. And how many hours a day? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Twenty-four. Twenty-four hours. All the time. Twenty-four, seven, all the time. It's called uh, aprati hata, incessant, non-stop. Twenty-four hours. Twenty-four, seven. He never desired anything else for his own self-gratification. He engaged all his senses in devotional service. Of different right. kinds of service, but they're all devotional service. And that is the way to increase our attachment for the Lord, which makes us completely free from all material desires. Is that point clear? Yep. Okay. So we are basically at the end of our introduction. I just want to repeat the main points. We must do pure devotional service as defined in these two verses, which is engaging our purified senses in the service of Krishna, devoid of any material desires, like no material motive, motive, uh, motives, and not covered by jnana or karma, etc. In other words, not letting karma kanda, jnana kanda activities or any other rituals become primary activity in our life. They remain secondary, if at all. And the intent is to always, always, somebody? Oh, always Krishna. remember Krishna. Never Please Krishna. Krishna. Please Krishna. That's the key word. Just one word. Always the intention is to please Krishna. If it's not pleasing Krishna, uh, sorry, if the intention is not to please Krishna, it's not bhakti. Okay, we talk in great detail about that. So, it has taken us three sessions to get to the end of introduction. But it's very important that we really understand what these two verses are saying because the rest of the book is based on these two verses. So, it's very, very important that, you know, if you have to go back, listen to the recording again or read whatever the handouts or the book, please do that because the rest of the sessions will be based on these two, or this principle of Anayabhlashta Shunyam. And the better you understand this, the more sense the rest of the book will make, and the more you will get out of it. So I cannot overemphasize the need to make sure you please read these verses, try to understand what's being said, not to memorize anything, but just to realize what's the message here. What are the bottom line? What is the bottom line? What is it that uh, we must do so that we don't have to memorize anything? Um, no, Ratta Lagao is realize. Realize the message and see if we can apply that in our life. 
So yeah. I'll wait for any questions. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, next session and that'll be the end of the class. Well, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we do bhakti and to do bhakti, we need to get Krishna's permission. So how do we get Krishna's permission? Yeah, we, we get it through the Shastras, Sadhu, San, Sadhu Shastra, and Gauranga. So, so we, we get the instruction from our spiritual master or from the Shastras or other senior devotees. And, uh, and you follow them. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So let's, in that case, let's talk about um, the next week. We'll start chapter one, which talks about characteristics of pure devotional service. So in the introduction, we try to understand what is pure devotional service. And now we'll try to understand um, what are the six characteristics of pure devotional service. And we'll get into a lot of detail there's a whole discussion of karmas, etc., which always gets people going. So I suspect it will be three sessions for chapter one also. And then it becomes a little faster because other chapters are simpler and, and shorter. So um, again, I'm going to try and send you some handouts. So if possible, please read before you come to the next session. Because if you read them, the class will make a lot more sense as opposed to if you are just listening okay and that's it if there are no other questions we'll stop here Prabhu, we uh, we still have other shlokas in this first yeah they'll come in the, i send you in advance but they'll come later okay Prabhu. thank you Prabhu. they'll come later this is chapter uh, i think uh, 10 to 3 chapter 29 i think yeah they'll come later any other questions or comments Did I do, go too fast today or were you okay no, with this? Probably it is very nice. No, very nice, Prabhuji. I think nice. what is the bhakti you cleared so nicely, Prabhuji, about bhakti, different components and a lot of, you know, comparison. It's very nice. So really helpful, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Yeah. It is perfect, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. You don't Anybody move does. unless you make us understand. Thank you, bro. Very nice class, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, is this Saturday Janardham Maharaj class is there or not? I'm sorry, bro. Janardham Maharaj class this Saturday will be there or not? I haven't seen any notice, bro. I, I also don't see. Will there be an email on that? Well, there will be a notice uh, in uh, either... GKG one in number four or two or whatever, or uh, it will be in um, North American disciples. So anyway, I'll make sure that everybody knows, but I have had no notice yet. Okay, probably. good. Then Actually, there was a possibility that even Guru Maharaj might come, but I don't know yet. Yeah, but, but it is already more than a month gone. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? <coughs> Okay, then thank you so much, all thank of you. Thank you, Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. I hope your health is doing good, Prabhu. Thank you, Mother. Yeah, it's getting better, Mother. It's taking its time now. will be perfect tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prabhu Ji. Thank you, Prabhu Ji. Thank you so much, Prabhu Ji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.